Hi, this is Manjula Narayan, books editor of Hindustan Times, and this is Bookstack, uh, you know, the show where I pick the nicest books that I've got this week. And I've got some really nice books. As always, I get good books. But uh, this time I've got um, Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime. international celebrity and uh, this is I, in this, this book you know it's about growing up in South Africa uh, growing up under apartheid what that was like and it's kind of it's got its funny moments which are funny but not very funny but are still hilarious you have to read the book I am I'm enjoying it so I'll read, as usual, I'll kind of read the blur, you know, the black, the back, so you know what it's about. Trevor Noah's unlikely path from apartheid po poverty to becoming one of the biggest names in comedy began with a crime, his birth. Born to a black Zosa mother and a white Swiss father at a chapter from this book about um, uh, him as a child. You know, running after his father and his father running away because it was a crime to be a mixed race couple in South Africa. It's a very famous excerpt. So that's that's from this book. Um, um, yeah. Trevor was kept indoors for most of his early life in hiding from a government that could at any moment steal him away. Finally, liberated by the fall of apartheid, Trevor and his mother set forth on a grand adventure into the dangers and opportunities of a new South Africa. His experiences are by turns hilarious, dramatic, and deeply affecting. Whether subsisting on caterpillars in hard times, being thrown from a moving car, stories weave together to form an unforgettable portrait of a boy making his way through a damaged world in a dangerous time, armed only with a keen sense of humor. I mean, we all know a sense of humor. And his mother's unconventional, unconditional love. And his mother comes out as one fantastic woman. I mean, <laughs> there's some, uh, you know, like really funny parts. Um, here, I'll read this bit. This is, you know, each chapter has this kind of preface. And this is one of them. Um, when I was growing up, and this is, it kind of sheds light on his mother's character, the feistiness and her, and her, I mean, the sort of woman she is. When I was growing up, my mom spent a lot of time trying to teach me about women. She was always giving me lessons, little talks, pieces of advice. It was never a full-blown sit-down lecture about relationships. It was more like tidbits along the way, and I never understood why, because I was a kid. The only women in my life were my mom and my grandmother and my aunt and my cousin. I had no love interest whatsoever, yet my mom insisted. She would go off on a whole range of things. Trevor, remember a man is not determined by how much he earns. You can still be the man of the house and earn less than your woman. Being a man is not what you have, it's who you are. Being more of a man doesn't mean your woman has to be less than you. Trevor, make sure your woman is a woman in your life. Don't be one of these men who makes his wife compete with his mother. A man with a wife cannot be beholden to his mother. Hmm, I think a lot of Indian mothers should kind of take this lesson to heart. The smallest thing could prompt her. I'd walk through the house on the way to my room and say, Hey mom, without glancing up. She'd say, No Trevor, you look at me. You acknowledge me. Show me that I exist to you because the way you treat me is the way you will treat your woman. Women like to be noticed. Man, this, this lady is really something. Come and acknowledge me and let me know that you see me. Don't just see me when you need something. These little lessons were always about grown-up relationships, funnily enough. She was so preoccupied with teaching me how to be a man that she never taught me how to be a boy, how to talk to a girl or pass a girl and go to class. There was none of that. She only taught me about adult things. She would even lecture me about sex. As I was a kid, that would get very awkward. Trevor, don't forget, you're having sex with a woman in her mind before you're having sex with her in her vagina. Trevor, foreplay begins during the day. It doesn't begin in the bedroom. I'd be like, what? What is foreplay? What does that even mean? So, <laughs> you know, has stuff.
up like this. And it's like really, it's quite a lovely read. It's really an interesting book. Uh, I would, you know. And you read it and you realize why this guy is so successful. I mean, he's the host of the Emmy and the Peabody Award winning daily show, succeeding John Stewart in 1950. Uh, 2015, and you know, he's like a world class star. So, and he's, I mean, become big all over the world. So, that's Trevor Noah, uh, Born a Crime Stories from a South African Childhood. And definitely, definitely worth reading. I mean, I'd like to read some more bits from it, but then, I mean, I'm just keep reading parts and parts. You know, there's a little bit called this chapter called Chameleon which is uh, you know about his because he's because he has a white father he's obviously fair uh, in comparison to the rest of the family so this so that kind of and throughout the book he plays on that on the fact you know on his status as mixed race and maybe a lot of his humor comes from his ability to see both sides and from having grown up in uh, in such a in a society that's like so driven by race and color. And the, this is chapter four, it's called Chameleon. One afternoon I was playing with my cousins. I was a doctor and they were my patients. I was operating on my cousin Bulelwa's ear with a set of matches when I accidentally perforated her eardrum. All hell broke loose. My grandmother came running in from the kitchen. Quenzeka not Tony. Sorry, I as it's been. What's happening? There was blood coming out of my cousin's ear. We were all crying. My grandmother patched up Bulelwa's ear and made sure to stop the bleeding. But we kept crying because clearly we've done something we were not supposed to do. And we knew we were going to be punished. My grandmother finished up with Bulelwa's ear and whipped out a bed. Then she beat the shit out of Bulelwa. Then she beat the shit out of Lungisi too. She didn't touch me. Later that night, my mother came home from work. She found my cousin with a bandage over her ear and my grand crying at the kitchen table. What's going on? My mom said. Oh, Nombu say hello, she said. Trevor is so naughty. He's the naughtiest child I've ever come across in my life. Then you should hit him. I can't hit him. Why not? Because I don't know how to hit a white child, she said. A black child, I understand. A black child, you hit them and they stay black. Trevor, when you hit him, he turns blue and green and yellow and red. I've never seen those colors before. I'm scared I'm going to break him. I don't want to kill a white person. I'm so afraid. I'm not going to touch him. And she never did. My grandmother treated me like I was white. My grandfather did too. Only he was even more extreme. He called me master. In the car, he insisted on driving me as if he were my chauffeur. Master was always sitting in the back seat. I never challenged him to it. On it. What was I going to say? I believe your perception of race is flawed, Grandfather. No, I was fine. I sat in the back. There were so many perks to being white in a black family. I can't even count. I was having a great time. My own family basically did what the American justice system does. I was given more lenient treatment than the black kids. Misbehavior that my cousins would have been punished for, I was given a warning and let off. And I was way naughtier than either of my cousins. It wasn't even close. If something got broken or if someone was stealing granny's cookies, it was me. I was troubled. My mom was the only force I truly feared. She believed if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. But everyone else said, no, he's different. And they gave me a pass. Growing up the way I did, I learned how easy it is for white people to get comfortable with a system that awards them all the perks. I knew my cousins were getting beaten for things that I'd done. But I wasn't interested in changing my grandmother's perspective because that would mean I'd get beaten too. Why would I do that? So that I'd feel better? Being beaten didn't make me feel better. I had a choice. I could champion racial justice in our home, or I could enjoy granny's cookies. I went with the cookies. So, you know, I mean, it's a book that gives you an insight into Trevor Noah's mind, and also into his family, and into South African society, and his, his brand of comedy, where it comes from. Good. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. I've already got people asking me whether they can take it. <laughs> <laughs> After I finish reading it. Next we have a very interesting book on uh, the Indian Railways. Oh, one of my page markers has flown. Never mind. 
and um, Indian Railway is the weaving of a national tapestry. Vivek Debroy, Sanjay Chadda, and Vidya uh, Krishnamurti. Oh, you know, it's like, well, it's a book of Indian Railway. It's such a massive daily model. And you know, we've all been on it. Maybe young people now, not so much. Uh, but definitely, as one grew up, like you spend days traversing the subcontinent and <laughs> spending, uh, you know, time on trains and meeting strangers and having long conversations that you would never have had unless you were on, you know, a train. And it, I mean, in, in, in our lives are now so busy that we can't afford to set aside two days to travel. But that's what it used to be like. And it used to foster friendships and conversations, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, before air travel became cheaper. So, in India. So, but this is so, so one is always fascinated with, uh, uh, with the railways and how it kind of bound, binds the country together. So this book is full of anecdotes, very nice, very interesting, you know, um, like a lot of uh, stuff that you don't know about the Indian railways, I mean you see the railways, you just take them for granted, but um, so much effort you know, has gone into setting them up, I mean there have been books about it. and like the introduction says, there are many books, very scholarly books written about the Indian railways, but um, this is a book for the lay reader, for the general reader who can't be you know, bothered to, uh, to plow through thousands of details to get to small factoids. But this this book is rich in uh, uh, rich in a lot of uh, ways. So uh, yeah, so as you should the black the back flag. Um, the railways brought modernity to India. Its vast network connected the far corners of the subcontinent, making travel, communication, and commerce simpler than before. Even before, uh, even more importantly, the railways played a large part in the making of the nation. That's true. I mean, where you know, before, I mean, a Bengali wouldn't even know what a, a Maharashtrian was like before the railways. I mean, you have to travel days and days to get from Calcutta to Bombay, I don't know, by a bullock cart or horse, um, carriage, dark, you know. But the railways came in and brought the country together, gave it a, a sort of unity in many ways. Even more importantly, the railways played a large part in the making of the nation by connecting historically and geographically disparate regions and people it forever changed the way Indians lived and thought and eventually made a national identity possible. This engagingly written, anecdotally told history captures the immense power of a business behemoth as well as a romance of rail travel, train travel. I mean, it's very romantic except for the toilets. I still see it. Tracing the growth of the railways from the 1830s when the first plans were made to independence, Vivek De Bruyne and his co-authors recount how the railway network was built in India and how it grew to become a lifeline that still weaves the nation together. So that's what this latest volume uh, would delight anyone interested in learning more about the Indian railways. So yeah, so and you know, I mean, what I liked about this is that it's got like these little things, you know, about how Kipling, uh, Kipling features a lot. He wrote a lot also. Uh, so and it's got nice tables, you know. It uh, gives you a uh, timeline of the establishment of rail, uh, railway lines in India. It's it's like I don't know if you're into uh, factoids and into trivia. This is like this is great because it's presented nicely and you can just like how in 1851 the experimental line from Calcutta to Rajmahal. You know, the Howrah to Hooghly, the first train in Easter India, all that stuff is, is down here. So it's like, it's making my uh, trivial pursuit side of my personality very really exciting. So that's one thing. Yeah, and you know, like, the whole, I mean, if you've been uh, to all the railway stations, especially in Northern India, and even Central India and Western, you'll see, like, the AH wheeler bookstores are all over the place. I mean, every every station has an AH wheeler, and that's where you. I mean, in the south, it's Higginbottoms, 
but you when you get off the train and you want to buy uh, magazines or books to read, you go to the edge wheeler. And there's a whole history about that, which which is mentioned here in this book. And again, Kipling, Raya took Kipling features in it. Many of the Kipling stories, including The Man Who Would Be King, were first published by the Indian Railway Library. This was a publishing concern set up by A.H. Wheeler in Allahabad in 1888. Wheeler had a monopoly on selling books at railway stations. Both the Indian Railway Library and Wheeler are part of the historical legacy of the Indian Railway system. You know, I always wondered about it. I thought, oh, it must be some old family which has been done here. But the story is even more interesting. Uh, both the Indian Railway... Oh, yeah. The Indian Railway library, library was Kipling's idea. He needed money to fund his return to England in 1888 and for something that was a bit like a world tour. To this end, he approached Emile Edouard Moreau with a proposal that his stories should be republished. They had all been published earlier in cheap prints. Illustrated by, they had all been published earlier. So he wanted them to be published in cheap prints. Illustrated by Kipling's father, John Lockwood Kipling, who used to be, I mean, I don't know, again, Trivia uh, buffs would know that he was the uh, he was the principal of uh, the JJ School of Art in Bombay, where Raya Kipling himself was born. So, six um, illustrated by Kipling's father John Lockwood Kipling. Six such collections were published: Soldiers Three, the story of the Gladsby's in black and white, Under the Deodars, the Phantom Rickshaw, and uh, and other eerie tales, and We Willy Winky and other child stories all at rupees one inch, princely sum. Nothing else was ever published by the Indian Railway Library. As for Emile Edward Moreau, who was born in 1856, he is often unnecessarily confused with the French playwright Emile Moreau, who was born that something else. So anyway, this Moreau guy happened to be in Allahabad at the time because he was an employee burden company. And so basically it goes on and how he with a you know, couple of friends, they set up um, uh, A.H. Wheeler, which still goes on today. And I mean, at some point when he returned to England, it was uh, the equity was taken over by the Banerjee family. So this mysterious Banerjee family now runs it, now has equity in uh, this legacy chain that everybody knows about but doesn't know about. And this book tells you about that. So stuff like this, you know, it's got some like really nice uh, Mm, nice bits in it which I'm enjoying and though I mean you could have avoided some stuff like it's a bit northern centric in the sense that uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about this. everyone has heard of Lord Dalhousie but not too many people have heard of Krishna Shastri Bhattavadekar but the only Bhatt uh, I mean the other famous Bhattavadekar is one I think Golmar Durandar Bhattavadekar the uh, Amol Palikar um, comment. Anyway, that's another story. What is remarkable is that in 1854, Bhattavadekar authored a book in Marathi on railways. In English, this is titled A Short Account of Railways, and there is a copy of the National Library in Canada. A book on railways has just been, had just been published in 1850 by some Lardner. Krishna Shastri Bhattavadekar's book drew heavily on Lardner. Nevertheless, it's quite remarkable that such a book was written and published in 1854, that too in Marathi. Now this seems a bit strange because the first, I mean, why should it be, why should it be remarkable? Because the first passenger train was from Bombay to Thane, you know, in Maharashtra, which is what is now Maharashtra, that is Bombay province then. So it's, in fact, it's very natural that, you know, in, 19, in 1854, one year after that passenger train, this Mr. Bhatha Vadekar should be writing this book. So, stuff like that, but that's, these are very small matters. So, yeah, go ahead and buy this book. Indian Railways, The Weaving of a National Tapestry. If you're like a train spotting freak, even if you're not a train spotting freak, still it's nice because it's part of our, you know, our great legacy. So, the Indian National Railways. And then finally, so for people who've come in late, this is book stack my weekly show where I look at, you know, I pick out some nice books that I've gotten. This week, this is uh, the first one I spoke about is Trevor Noah's Born a Crime, uh, stories from a South African childhood. Very, very, very nice. Good read. And um, also good read, Indian Railways, The Weaving of a National Tapestry. Uh, 
also good. So then, and finally, we have Business Woman by Tanuja Chandra. Tanuja Chandra is uh, the filmmaker. I remember watching I think Tamanna as the last one, but she's done a lot of work. I mean, I'm just a bad watcher of films, I guess. So very sporadic. But um, Tanuja Chandra is her name. And she's written Business Woman, Stories of Uttar Pradesh, told by my bosses, Buas and Chachas. Very interesting. I mean, because it's very intimate and very, um, you know, it comes from her own life and she knows. Uh, it's like how we know all our family stories and we're always, I mean, growing up, you're interested in speaking to your aunts and uncles and, you know, your grandparents and extended family and you hear all the gossip of the last five generations who ran away with whom and whose second wife did what to whom and you know, all that sort of uh, stuff and all the like politics which have which you know, who stole whose property and stuff like that which all families you know have these stories so what i mean i'm just an excerpt so i'm assuming that yeah, those sort of stories would also feature and um, so I'll, I'll read a bit, uh, a quirky bittersweet, quirky bittersweet tales from small town Uttar Pradesh. And it comes with great um, you know, recommendations, not required but still I suppose it helps sales from Am Amitabh Bachchan. For me reading this book evokes absolute nostalgia. A masalidar mix of fact, fiction, action and emotion, drama and fashion. What well, better than the blurb is actually the introduction, which uh, Tanuja Chandra has written. Very nice introduction, which is kind of like puts the whole uh, book in perspective. You know, you know, um, you know what the book is about from the introduction. It's very nicely, very nicely written introduction. The voices of, a mo of my mossies, buas, chachas, pupas, cousins, the sound of their laughter, the sounds of my childhood. We would get together once a year. Some summers, the whole of us, the whole lot of us, would go to Srinagar. My eldest Mosaji was in the army, and his and he planned with the precision of a military operation: two months of eating, trekking, shikara riding, and of course laughter. My extended family, brimming, brimming with painters, would sit out with canvases. What better place than this to paint, while sharing kisses, funny and strange? Uh, or we go to Lucknow. The family would descend upon another Mossy's house, usually in winter, to lie on carts in the sun and tell stories. Or we'd go to Badam, where my father's side of the family here lived. Here too, my buas would tell us stories as we ate imarti and kachori, and lay back on, on chatiyas in the bed during day, a lazy afternoons. My mother and father would both defend the legends of the individual birth, uh, birthplaces, which goes on like that. The stories I heard during these vacations stayed with me. There was something different about these odd tales, something unu unusual about the experiences of my Rishtidars, their neighborhoods and communities. There was something unique, in fact, about the people in Uttar Pradesh. And of course, everybody from India State thinks this about their own people, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, so then she goes on. Um, you know, she's talking about her family and all the you know, characters in her family. Not uh, more so. And uh, says that she never tires of listening to them. They're generally in entertaining people and they remain so. My father's sisters, one of them turned 19, 20, 16, derived hellish enjoyment from tales of their childhood. A childhood that wasn't easy by any means. But their but their eminent laugh their eminent laughers about much of it. There was a chacha of theirs, they say, who once became furious about a spate of thefts in Badam and bought a gun. One night, as part of a wedding contingent returning home, they all formed a circle around their baggage at the train station, a popular haunt of thieves. Their suitcases contained silks and jutis, and most preciously, a ton of some high quality material. They would keep the strictest vigil while waiting for the morning train to arrive. Besides, Chacha Ji had sworn that he would die before he'd allow the rascals to steal from him. Could a group of revelers stay awake? Though, after three days of Puri, Chole, Jalebi, and Rabbi, inevitably encircling their bags, the vigil groupers fell asleep, and a thief was able to sit successfully tiptoe over them. He was about to get away with two bags. He come clumsily tripped and fell. <laughs> there was commotion and noise. People ran after him. 
Chacha ji aimed his gun. The fellow ran, bag still in his hand. Chacha ji, Chacha ji's hand shook so badly that he was unable to fire the gun. The thief would have got away had he not met his prickly on a strand of barbed wire on the far side of the tracks. Blind in the pitch black of the night, he fell, and the wedding party was able to bring him down eight to one. By this time, Chacha Ji had managed to pull the trigger, but the gun didn't fire, something to do with a rusted barrel. Uttar Pradesh, in my experience, is filled with such stories of great ambition and great failure, stories bursting at the scene with urgent longings and intense desires, alongside an abject inability to fulfill them. For this reason, I felt great affection for the people in these stories. So then she goes on, you know, uh, talking about these stories. These stories are old, but they aren't older than the history of human relationships. And relationships, though they change, remain as always a web of emotion, tapestries of love and sorrow, registers of desire, anger, jealousy, greed, lust, generosity, and sacrifice. So very nice stories. I mean, I flip through a couple of them. And you know, they have a cinematic quality, which isn't surprising, considering, I mean, considering that she works in film and, and that she obviously has a, a visual sense of beauty. So, here, this, um, I can't resist reading this little bit. The beginning of the story uh, called The Tea Stop, that's number five. When they told her mother that Rani's chappals and sari were found at a faraway ghat, she fell on the ground with an impact that would make her lower back ache till the end of her life. She knew at once it was over. She knew her daughter had ended her life. Over several hours, the search party had persisted and tried diligently to come up with best case scenarios. Rani had gone to bed. Her leg might have been caught in the reverse current, and she must have been swept away only to be washed ashore on another distant bank. Chances were that she would grow up, show up in another village further down Gangaji. But her mother knew. And now, when both husband and wife gave way to tears, everyone knew it was time to stop imagining unrealistic outcomes. People began consoling them. It was better this way, they said. She had found some peace at last. She was with God. This was Garmukteshwar Gar after all. A city littered with sati pillars that bore witness to the exact spots where widows had committed suffering. She had bravely done her duty. The girl had chosen the right path. Let her go, Amma, a kind man, in search of what he said. If you cry too much, her Atma will be Rani's Chautha was performed at the Gangaga itself. It was attended not just by relatives who had travelled from home. Strangers too came to pray for her. The tragic story of this very young woman pulled people together to saw the spontaneous outpouring of affection. For five years after this, on the same day, her parents came to the Mark, Mark Mila, to wash away their desolation, bit by bit, to offer prayers at the Holy Rivers show. They handed out food and clothing to the poor and Rani's men and sat for a few silent minutes at the exact time they found the chakras and sadhya the place they left behind. And then people stopped talking about Rajra. It just made more sense this way. She had brought too much shame upon the family, a name that for decades had been uttered with reverence in some amount of fame, a name that I haven't seen the ignominy of being caught on the wrong foot. It made eminently more sense to not bring up, bring up her story at all. She was dead, the humiliation done with. Until a hot afternoon, five years later, when a neighbor saw her in a big city less than 70 kilometers away, walking through the Sanji Mandir. So that's the story. I mean, and then it goes on. You learn what happens. So, you know, it's a very visual uh, storytelling style. Nice. So let's see. Has anybody said anything? Have we had any comments? Or it's. Or as usual, you guys have been silently watching me do my thing. <coughs> now, shall I ref refresh? Yeah. At this time, people must be sleeping in their homes or at home. No, no. Mm -hmm. all uh, they should be read Where up. is this question? Uh, where? If you click on the video. I am timely. Yeah. Yeah. Nice yoga here. Come on, dude, just listen to me reading the book. Very boring, said Rohit Ar. Dude, don't watch it if it's so boring. Um, you don't have any work today, that's why you're reading books somewhere. Yeah, yeah. 
for unpads like you probably true. So Rochna Das is not audible. Was it not audible? It was fine, Richard. You have to tap on the video to make it. You have to tap on the video. So okay. आगे तुम संजीत। You guys have nothing else to say? आगे। Man, maybe I should rethink. I should rethink this show. If nobody is even engaging, what the hell? What do you want to show? Gosh, what is this? A country of non-readers. Anyway, last time's audience was much better. Please return the same people who watched last time. At least there was a lot of in interaction. Anyway, so that's it. This is Bookstack. I'll come back again next uh, next week. Hopefully, the people who choose to watch are more uh, inspiring to me. Here we have. So again, I'll go through the books of the uh, Trevor Noah uh, book on the in Indian Railways and Business Woman by Tanvika Chakra. So guys, see you then. Thanks uh, very much for not interacting. <laughs> this is Bookstack. See you guys. Bye.